In this episode, we're going to be taking a practical look at ducting design. G'day, I'm Trav. Welcome back to The Fast and the Nerdy. If you haven't seen the episode on ducting theory, I suggest you watch that one first, as I'm going to glance over the theory in this one. When it comes to ducting design, we need to juggle a few balls. Trying to increase the air flowing through the radiator whilst minimising cooling drag isn't easy. To do that, we need to limit the amount of air flowing through the ducting, but increase the amount of air flowing through the radiator. Not an easy task. Unfortunately, when designing ducting, we need to optimize it for a certain speed. So it won't work perfectly if we're going faster or slower than that speed. But if we design it correctly, we should be able to improve cooling across all speeds. One way to help that is by using a fan, but that isn't always an option and in most racing cases isn't necessary. Our first consideration is where to position the inlet. We want it high to help ensure we have as cool air flowing through the radiator as possible. Track temps can be 10 degrees higher than ambient air temp. As an example, we can see here that the cooling capacity of this system would reduce from 11 kilowatts to 9 kilowatts with a 10 degree increase in air temp. Whilst we do want cold air, our main concern is placing the inlet in a position where it's well aligned with the incoming air. Here we have a good example of this. Whilst the upper inlet makes up 58% of the total opening area, it only contributes 33% of the mass flow rate. This CFD slice paints a pretty clear picture of what's going on. The first thing that stands out is the upper opening is less vertical and therefore less aligned with the airflow. If we zoom in, we can see that the stagnation point is quite close to the lower grill and is helping to further align the airflow with the grill. It's almost channeling it in. Whereas on the upper grill, the air hits the front of the car, turns 90 degrees upwards, and then needs to turn another 90 degrees to get into the grill. Clearly the air is less aligned. All of these things mean that despite the upper grill being 35% larger than the lower grill, it is only flowing 89% of what the lower grill is, but it's producing the same amount of drag. Here we have another example where a slightly misaligned duct causes the flow to stall. A redesign increased flow by 10%. One way to help with aligning the duct under all driving conditions is to radius the edges. Here we have a slightly exaggerated example, but as you can see, by having a radius edge, we take advantage of the coander effect, which helps to keep the flow attached to the walls. This is especially important during slow maneuvers, such as turning or braking. We already have less air flowing through the radiator as it is. Anything we can do to help it stay attached is going to pay dividends. But having said that, if we have a look at the results of some wind tunnel testing done by Race Car Engineering magazine back in 2007 on our Formula Ford, we can see that they recorded slightly less drag and lift when they restricted the radiator ducting inlet with race tape over inlet reducers made with a nice radius edge. They did only test with the air coming straight on and didn't measure the flow through the radiator, so it may have hurt the flow badly, but it's something to consider if radius edges are hard to manufacture or you have limited space for the diffuser. The next step, which seems super important, but is more a byproduct of the rest of the system, is the size of the inlet area. We can use recommendations as a good starting point, but depending on who you're talking to, they range anywhere from between 17 to 60% of the radiator core. We could go with the OEM standard, which according to Thomas Wolf from Porsche, is 40% of the radiator core. But as we can see here, Porsche don't follow that rule. They got as low as 16% of the core in 2001, but they seem to favor a value around the 25% of the core. We might be tempted to go on the safe side and use the largest recommendation, but as we can see here, the velocity ratio, that is the speed of the air at the face of the radiator to that of the free air speed is to the power of three in the internal drag equation. So we want to reduce the airspeed by as much as possible, helping to increase the static pressure at the face of the radiator whilst reducing drag. Having a small inlet with a large diffuser is our way to achieve this. Ideally, we would have a test rig set up where we can adjust the inlet and outlet sizes on the vehicle, record the drag and mass flow through the radiator, allowing us to optimize it for our car. Unfortunately, that sort of setup isn't realistic for 90% of people. But we do have a fairly simple testing procedure described in Automobile Aerodynamics where we record the velocity ratio and adjust the inlet and outlet areas. They recommend that we set the outlet area to 1.2 times the radiator core, monitor the velocity ratio and adjust the inlet area until the velocity ratio is maximized. Then we adjust the outlet area and again monitor the velocity ratio until it is maximized. Once we've done that, according to them, we've maximized the flow through the radiator for the minimum amount of drag. But again, that's not always easy. But they do let us know what inlet sizes worked best using this method for different radiators. For a radiator with a low pressure drop or one with a low density of fins, they got best results with an inlet size of 80% of core. For a high pressure drop radiator or one with dense fins, they recorded the best result with an inlet of 67% of the core. 
And whilst the inlet size is important, what is more important is using an inlet area large enough that the angle between it and the radiator is gentle enough that the airflow stays attached to the walls. Here we have some recommendations for diffuser angles, but as we can see here, the shorter the length, the more angle we can use, getting up to 15 degrees for a short diffuser. But this is for just a diffuser. We have a radiator at the end of ours, which puts a backward pressure on the air flowing into the duct, allowing us to run even more angle. A good example of this is the 2005 Porsche 911. It has two radiators, each with a core area of 0.12 meters squared, situated just in front of each of the front wheels. When we look at the ducting area to the distance from the inlet, we can see that they increase the ducting area from 20 to 100% of the radiator core in under 200 mil. So fairly aggressive angles can be used if the system is set up for it. But if we exceed the allowed angle, it can have disastrous results on our cooling. And here is a good example of what it looks like when we get it wrong. This diffuser has an inlet height to ducting length ratio of 0.5. If we look at our graph down at the bottom, we can see that we should be able to run an angle of about 15 degrees with that setup. But this diffuser has 28 degrees. Because of that, the flow detaches from the bottom wall and creates a large vortex, blocking off two thirds of the ducting outlet. One way to overcome this is to add a vein. And when they did add a vein, there is a huge improvement. Nice smooth flow through the ducting has increased to just over half of the outlet. Still not ideal, but a massive improvement. If you do need to run a vein, try to position them in an area where you know the direction of the flow. That way you can get the angle of them just right. We now move on to the back end of the ducting system, which could be argued is the most important. When we compare the impact each of the four main components of the drag equation have on the cooling and drag for the 2005 Porsche 911, that is the pressure loss coefficient, the area of the radiator core, the outlet area, and the static pressure at the outlet, we can see that reducing the outlet area by 50% gave the largest drop in drag for the least impact on cooling flow. Similar results were recorded by Race Car Engineering Magazine during their wind tunnel testing of the Formula Ford. They generated less drag and lift by blanking off the exit area than they did from blanking off the inlet. Unfortunately, we don't know how it impacted cooling airflow, but when you combine that with the results from Porsche, it's quite interesting. And as you would probably expect, they recorded the largest reduction in both drag and lift when they blocked off both the inlet and the exit. The next question is how big an exit should we start with? The only recommendation I could find was from William Toet, who recommends 25% of the core. We can look at the aviation industry for inspiration, as long as we only look at planes where the speed isn't high enough that we need to worry about compressed air. And we can see that they run an exit area of somewhere in the range of 115 to 130% of the inlet is about the same as William Toad. His exit area size recommendation is 125% of his recommended inlet size. Again, we can look to Porsche. Their insanely low drag figures are partially due to their ducting design. Here you can see how much better they are at designing the ducting system to their competitors. Porsche have used an exit area smaller on the inlet on both the 2002 and 2005 911, but the 2005 exit broke the mold. It was just 7% of the core area. Even with the smaller exit, the system as a complete package increased the flow rate whilst reducing the cooling drag considerably. One thing they had to do, which brings us to the last ducting consideration, was to change where they placed the exit. We can see here that one of the keys to reducing the cooling drag is to place the exit of the ducting in an area where it creates negative interference drag, something Porsche are amazing at. In the 2002 911, they dropped the air straight down after the radiator. But they found in the 2005 911 that with the increased airflow needed for the more powerful engine, the 90 degree bend put too much pressure on the air flowing through the system and dropped the airflow whilst increasing drag considerably. They then tried a few different considerations and found that straight through into the wheel well whilst reducing the outlet by 50% gave them the best results. The new outlet location caused a reduction in the interference drag, but as a whole the system reduced drag considerably. We have some production car drag and flow rate figures for some different configurations. Clearly C is the pick of the bunch here. Having the exit in such a low pressure region gives the best flow for the minimal drag, while dropping it under the car gives us the worst flow for a large amount of drag. That is because we are dropping it in a high pressure zone, whilst the inlet is in a low pressure zone, increasing our interference drag whilst reducing the pressure differential across the system. As you can see, designing a ducting system is pretty tricky, but I hope this video helped in some way. If you'd like to learn more, all of the papers I reference in this video are in the description below. And I also have other videos on this topic you can check out. The one on the screen at the minute is more general ducting theory. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to give it a like. And I hope you have a great day.